Hello friends, I wanted to do a presentation for you today about the history of children's literature to give you an idea of its early beginnings and also where we're at in the modern day children's literature world. Before we can talk about literature though, we need to talk for just a moment about the changing perception um, of society and their view of childhood. There was an English philosopher named John Locke who wrote a book called Some Thoughts Concerning Education. And in there, he discussed how um, society needs to start thinking about childhood in a protected way, where instead of dressing and speaking and assuming that children can work just like adults, that children should be treated in a gentler way. And he um, suggested that books should be made for children that are easy and pleasant to read. And we know in the 20th century, um, child labor laws came into effect that did protect childhood. One interesting thing that I like to read about is um, in language research, there's different cultural perceptions of children as intentional. For example, in America, we consider babies as soon as they're born as intentional beings. We begin to speak to them and talk to them. We use baby talk or motherese, while other cultures wait a year to really start to talk to a child in an intentional way and some people even wait till they're much older maybe seven or eight or nine years old to begin to think of children as intentional beings so knowing that um, we now protect children in our society and the 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 way that children's literature has been produced over time does reflect the way we think about children and childhood um, Children's literature in the past was known to be something that was just uh, handwritten texts for the children of extremely wealthy people. And if the lower class children heard tales, it was through oral tradition and oral language um, through storytellers. Fairy tales, myths, and ballads, and epics were passed down from generation to generation um, through storytellers. When the printing press was invented, um, a, books for adults began to be printed, such as Aesop's Fables, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver Travels, Daniel Defoe's Robin Crusoe, Robinson Crusoe, um, but children kind of adopted those as their own rather than who they were meant for in the adult audiences. There was something called a horn book or a lesson paddle that existed um, in the early 15th through the 17th centuries. It was made of wood and it was a small paddle that had pieces of parchment on it and it would have alphabet letters, verses from the Bible, and different things like that. Usually the horn books or lesson paddles were very moral or they would teach a lesson of good and evil and had a religious, pious um, undertone to teach children how they should be behaving. Despite the preachy, often unpleasant nature of children's literature in the early days of printing, there became a book um, that was published called Orbis Pictus, which means the world in pictures. And that is often called the very first children's picture book. It's filled with woodcut illustrations, and the children really loved it at that time. In, 19, in 1697, Charles Perrault, had been collecting French fairy tales and he published um, the Tales of Mother Goose which included the Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella and that was um, one of the first beginnings of books published meant for children. Um, there was also an underground reading that became popular called chapbooks. Chapbooks were printed booklets often sold by peddlers for pennies. They were very popular um, and they did not have uh, any sort of religious undertones. It was mostly fun tales like um, Robin Hood, King Arthur, Froggy Went According, and different um, stories for children. And there's a picture there of what they would look like. And they were sold in the streets um, by vendors on the side of the road. So the influences of John Locke um, and the influences of chapbooks really uh, influenced John Newberry. John Newberry began the first children's publishing house. He released his first children's book in 1744 called A, Li A Little Pretty Pocket Book, and there's the cover right there. And it taught the alphabet. It didn't have any um, catechisms in there, but it did have entertaining games, rhymes, and fables. 
Newberry published hundreds of titles, um, some of which he wrote himself. One of the most famous and enduring um, stories was the history of Little Goody Two Shoes. And he had a really great influence on be the beginnings of children publishing. And so that is why we have America's top children's book award called the John Newberry Medal. With the onset of the 19th century brought some of the most influential and lasting stories that still are in print today. John and Wilhelm Grimm collected from oral sources the German variants of the folk and fairy tales and he and they retold them in the Household Tales which appeared in 1812 and included Snow White and Rumpelstiltskin. Some of Hans Christian Andersen's original fairy tales were published in 1835 in a volume titled Fairy Tales Told for Children. Um, that included The Ugly Duckling, The Emperor's New Clothes, and many other stories that are still popular today. The century's greatest contribution to verse for children came from England. Edward Lear's A Book of Nonsense in 1846, a collection of outrageous limericks, and it was immediately a bestseller. Um, Edward Lear made the limerick a famous form of poetry. And Robert Louis Stevenson wrote A Child's Garden of Verses in 1885, which is another poetry collection that children still love today. A number of noteworthy books surfaced during the second half of the 19th century. Fantasy novels emerged with the publication of such greats as The Water Babies. Other noteworthy titles included Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, um, At the Back of the North Wind, The Adventures of Pinocchio, and some novels by Jules Verne. Stories about contemporary life were especially um, religious and preachy at the time. Little Women in 1868 by Louisa May Alcott, when that was published it was like a breath of fresh air. It had characters that um, were not preaching religion and it was just um, normal sisters in a family and each sister had a different type of archetype and it really was one of the first contemporary fiction stories of, of the time. A few years later Mark Twain wrote The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, Treasure Island was written, and it was published in a magazine at first called Young Folks and later as a book. And the last decade of the 19th century also gave us the masterpiece Jungle Book um, stories that were also in magazines at first. One thing about children's literature um, that's interesting is that many of the early stories that we know were published first in magazines for children. It was popular in the 19th century and especially in a magazine called the St. Nicholas Magazine. It was published in the United States and started in 1873 and it really did set the standards of excellence. It was edited by Mary Mapes Dodge who was the author of a book called Hans Brinker or the Silver Skates and some of the best known children's authors and illustrators contributed to the St. Nicholas Magazine and several of their, no several of their novels um, that were published had appeared first in the magazine in a shorter form. Some of those stories were Joe's Boys, Sarah Crew, and the Jungle Book stories. So I just wanted to show you some of the early published children's literature that I have on my shelf. Um, like it was mentioned before, many of the books for children had a religious undertone and so it was they were published to teach a lesson, to teach good and evil, to teach manners. And so you would often find prayers or advice about what would happen if you um, did the wrong thing. Or it even might um, try to make children feel fearful about choosing the wrong. At that time, um, of early publishing there was also the school economy. Not only in the public were they publishing books but stories for children were being created and put into anthologies or what we call basal readers now. Um, one of the first are known as McGuffey readers. 
they were in the American, American schools from 1836 to 1960, and um, they've kind of made their way back recently. They're, uh, the McGuffey readers had over 120 million sets sold, and they definitely were moralistic and ethical in the stories that they wrote. There's some of the book covers there. Another example of a popular Basil reader that was published by Scott Forsman was, um, were the Dick and Jane stories. Many of you might recall um, learning how to read. It, it had a phonics feel to it where you would learn whole words, and then those words would, would repeat. It's called the look-say method of learning to read, and they were published in the, in the 1930s through the 1960s. Here's, here's an example of the Silver Burdette reader, which was similar to the McGuffey reader. And inside, you can see one of the stories has predictable words, repetitive words, and definite phonics um, focus. This completes part one of the history of children's literature.